Benghazi is a political organizer, a vocally anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist thinker, and an indigenous revolutionary. She currently works as an assistant professor in the departments of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico, and also organizes with the Red Nation, an indigenous-led leftist organization committed to immediate and material decolonization. She's the lead editor of Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education, and Society, an international journal, and has co-written two incredibly important books, The Red Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth, and Red Nation Rising, From Border Town Violence to Native Liberation. We talk about those texts here and about some of Yazzie's forthcoming book projects. I want to stress that Yazzie's work decodes and diagnoses the individualism that characterizes liberal politics and that she is, as she explains here, deeply frustrated about how that individualism represents a lack of progress and that that individualism as well is a, a key component of the liberal takeover of radical politics, in part via the reassuring language of reconciliation. In relation to that problem, Yazzie talks about the palpable confusion and alienation that she sees among white settlers who participate in solidarity protests alongside indigenous peoples. What she says we tend to overlook though is that this alienation is the defining feature of capitalism and that the desire to be close to and internalize the type of connection and feeling of interdependency that indigenous peoples feel toward the land even if it comes from a sincere place, is a deeply messy, difficult, and unsettling tendency. The way Yazi puts it, it's that liberalism, quote, guts the radical militant demands of movements and pushes us into regimes of representation that are about piecemeal gestures to change. She says, for example, that the truth and reconciliation process in Canada doesn't create the kind of peace and justice that indigenous frontline struggles are advocating for because it is about this kind of peak repentant colonizer mentality. But she notes that settler extremism, fascism, is on the rise and that it's quote a direct response to the existential threat that even a change in the symbolic order represents. But she's also reflecting here on how as an educator she has seen a full-scale assault on education too. Right? And she, she really emphasizes that it makes a lot of sense, in her words, that the realm of ideas and the realm of intellectual production has become a battleground politically. What's so insightful about her, her specific mode of doing research, what's so exciting about it, is that her relationship with ideas palpably shifts as a result of being a political organizer. Like she talks about the uptick in political mobilization among indigenous peoples at approximately the time that Red Nation was founded in 2014. She sees this as a kind of cultural revolution that's happening in the United States, but globally as well, where the increased representation of BIPOC folks both in popular culture and in politics is provoking this shift. In this context, I think, you know, maybe most profoundly, she's asking, how can we accept or produce any sort of ambiguity or uncertainty in our communication in this moment of intensifying and very real crises? Isn't that irresponsible? I want to start by citing an interview from 2017 with Glenn Coulthard uh, in this book, What Moves Us? Um, he makes the point that, quote, it's pretty useless talking to an unrepentant colonist because there's no room for dialogue. There's no room for movement. It's just a relationship of conflict and force. Um, and he claims that it's easier to speak to a repentant, shameful subject. They at least have some embodied sense. He says that this you know, isn't right. Uh, similarly, in Red Nation Rising, you write that it's imperative that just awareness raising um, you know, just recognition, not act as a sort of sa salve for white guilt that just reinforces a kind of white savior complex. Um, and, you know, like that to me is like a pretty complicated provocation. Like, do these, are these kinds of things worrying to you? Um, how often do you think about these kinds of questions about how to navigate 
um, the kind of white savior complex and, you know, whether to what extent it's like worthwhile to speak to a quote unquote unrepentant colonist versus a repentant, shameful subject. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, it sounds like something Glenn would say, <laughs> first of yeah, all, sure. something like that. But yeah, I think, um, you know, the question of how you organize with or deal with or educate or appeal to like a, the settler population when you're building indigenous movements or just trying to, you know, advance an indigenous, an indigenous political agenda for decolonization, which is essentially um, what my work is about. It's all what the Red Nation is about. Um, it's it's one, I would say, one of the most vexing uh, things that we deal with. And there's never a clear answer. And most of the time, it's just, um, the, it's dealt with through incredible frustration <laughs> about the lack of progress, actually, I would say, um, both from the indigenous movement in terms of how to deal with it, but then also like the response to indigenous movements. Um, and the the frustration and, and the lack of progress, it, there, it happens for a myriad reasons. Uh, one of them is, I think the way, there's such like a profound misunderstanding of liberalism uh, and how that's operating at any given moment to, you know, to either kind of dissuade people from getting on board with kind of an unapologetic indigenous agenda for decolonization uh, in the sense of, you know, people um, wanting to, and by people, I mean, like primarily like settlers, settlers in places like the U.S. and Canada, I think wanting to get involved, uh, but doing it through a lens that creates a lot of, creates more problems, I think more, more often than it solves uh, something that, so just an example of this is oftentimes in frontline struggles, indigenous frontline struggles against resource extraction, which have become increasingly more popular, I think especially because of First Nations, um, like the Wet'suwet'en struggle, um, Unistoten camp, um, you know, the blockade, like the tiny house warriors uh, struggles over the last five to seven years down here, like um, against No Dapple and Standing Rock or Oak Flat um, against copper mining, that there are people flock to these struggles because they see a certain, you know, it's very powerful to see indigenous people rising up to protect the water and to defend the land. But it, what ends up happening is this like weird um, kind of return to cultural appropriation. And this just like profound confusion I see um, actually in, in particularly white settlers who come to these spaces and the confusion, I, it really hinges again um, on on what I'm using here, the term liberalism, because it's very difficult, I think, for people to see uh, the indigenous demands just for what they are, which are actually deeply militant and ap unapologetic and anti-colonial, right? Um, really at their core. And that the, the political demands that these movements are making are not based on a kind of like cultural and spiritual gesture towards inclusion because liberalism requires liberalism really hinges especially when it comes to um the way that it waters down kind of militant political demands whether that's coming from indigenous people or other struggles or other racialized struggles and communities is that what liberalism does oh i apologize is it really waters down the demands um the political demands and will often do that through the conversion of let's say uh, a militant political demand for decolonization into a cultural or like a spiritual movement. Mm -hmm. And so then you have people come to indigenous struggles expecting to have some sort of like spiritual or cultural fulfillment um, right. for their alienation um, and their isolation and their confusion. And then when they're met with, you know, rejection, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not a rejection based on meanness or lack of kindness or a lack of kinship, it's that, they, they, they expect this kind of performance, like a cultural and a spiritual performance from indigenous people um, that is not meant for them. Um, and it's not necessarily even meant for indigenous people. It's actually meant for the land and the water, um, for ancestors, for the future, right? Um, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a, a practice that's part of indigenous politics, um, kind of political demands for decolonization that's very much not about the self, or it's not even necessarily about human beings or about people. And so 
I find that, you know, this, this cultural, like this expectation almost for cultural and spiritual fulfillment and inclusion is just really rife, especially when it comes to environmental struggle. Um, of course, indigenous frontline struggles against resource extraction are very central, I think, to the larger environmental justice movement, um, at least in Turtle Island or in North America. Um, and oftentimes, like the white settlers, especially who are attracted to the environmental justice or the climate justice work, um, you know, they want to be one with nature, you know, they want to have this like spiritual relationship with the work. And then they gravitate to indigenous people because they think that's where they're going to find that fulfillment. And first of all, I'm, I'm sure that settlers feel alienation and isolation for two primary reasons. First of all, like you probably will never have a true sense of belonging on stolen land, on land that isn't yours, right? And it's not indigenous people's responsibility to rectify that situation. Um, I think it's the overturning of the colonial relation and um, settler colonialism itself that would create a different type of relationship between human beings and between human beings and land in what are today's settler societies. But the second is that that alienation is one of the um, defining features of capitalism um, in which right, Marx famously talked about commodity fetishism and the way in which we are alienated not only from our labor but also from um, ourselves and our creative power by purchasing goods instead of, you know, having a, a direct relationship with ourself and our self-development. And so you have people who are like in this profound state, I think of confusion, isolation, and alienation. And then they see indigenous people not being in that state, but in fact, having a deep and profound, the opposite of that sense of connection and interdependency and strength and a knowledge that goes back millennia, not just generations, a true belonging to place um, in, in this place that we call Turtle Island. And then, so they flock, they flock to it because they're like, wow, this is really, this speaks to me. And it's fine that it speaks to them, but it's also, it's not about them. <laughs> and I think that this is the most important takeaway. Um, and again, it's kind of the most frustration that we have is that repeatedly, no matter how we say it, no matter, you know, in the Red Nation, we like, we, we talk about how we don't, we don't perform culture and we don't perform tradition and spirituality for in public for the most part because it just gets read in this way. And then because of how, how strong liberalism is, this kind of like feel good conversion of politics into culture and spirituality that from what I can see historically like defangs, um, I think really the militant agendas for decolonization that are behind indigenous movements, um, grassroots movements, is that even if you don't perform culture and spirituality, someone will always expect you to, they'll get mad at you if you don't, or they'll still impose that on the struggle. And you can be, it's, it's like you can be screaming the political demands and that liberal expectation for culture and spirituality will still just be so strong in the energy that you're getting, particularly from white settlers. And this also comes from, from people of color, non-indigenous people of color that I encounter in the work. And so, how do we how do we stop that from happening <laughs> right is this question i always have how do you do it sometimes i get really angry um but how do we do it with like kindness but firmness i think is something that i grapple a lot with and that we in the red nation grapple a lot with and i would say that for the most part the people i'm talking about are the repentant <laughs> right the repentant colonizer that Very glenn good. is kind of categorizing in these two types of of settlers or these two types of colonizers Mm -hmm. And um, I think we would typically call those folks liberals for the most part, um, or radicals or progressives. And so those, I, I mean, the the non-repentant colonizer, like the fascists, <laughs> you know, like the white supremacists, exactly, yeah. um, the violent settlers, they're in some ways easier to deal with because you know, you, it's just like very, the lines are very clear. You know that mm -hmm. they're your enemy, right? You mm -hmm. know that they're your enemy. And so you can deal with them as such. But I think it's the repentant colonizers who are messy they're really messy and i've seen it yeah. yeah and i we we talk a lot in the red nation about gosh it would really be nice if we didn't have to spend so much time and expend so much energy on um trying to navigate those relationships and instead what if we just took all of that energy and that time and we directed it towards like organizing working class you know native people who mm -hmm. and and those who will understand and follow will do so um, and will do so in a respectful way 
but there is but there is this tendency still and it's just because of the the nature of settler colonialism in the United States particularly I'll talk about the US where native people you know we are expected to only look to the United States to only look to our colonizer for redress for justice for resources right for anything that would actually affect the future of native nations and native people and I, I really would like Native people, um, whether they're poly- tribal politicians or movements, movement-based um, organizers and leaders, or even scholars and intellectuals, to really resist the impulse to always go to um, our colonizer <laughs> first for like some sort of response or even like a battle or a fight against colonizer, and instead to either turn towards ourselves, which Glenn advocates for a lot, and also does Leanne, S- Leanne Simpson, who works a lot with Glenn. Um, to turn towards ourselves and each other or to turn to like international connections with other movements for decolonization and liberation that I think would generate a much more fruitful um, relationship for building movements um, rather than always, I don't know, just always having to grapple and expend a great deal of energy with the repentant colonizer. Um, I think, you know, the truth and reconciliation process in Canada is like peak repentant (laughs) colonizer kind of um, modality. And we have seen, you know, even then that uh, it doesn't actually create the the kind of peace and justice that Indigenous frontline struggles are looking for. And in fact, you know, the Canadian settler state is as violent as ever, um, apprehending more children, Indigenous children than ever before, um, still destroying frontline camps, destroying sovereignty and treaty rights um, through resource extraction and the building of infrastructure. And so it's Right, like that repentant gesture really doesn't have anything to do with indigenous people and it doesn't help us in any way, shape, or form. Yet we are expected because of the colonial relation to constantly invest our energies in trying to perfect it or like make it better. And I I have completely abandoned that, even though it is still very, very much captures the horizon um, of indigenous struggle in so many ways that I find remarkably frustrating. So long-winded answer, but um, I, I would probably have a lot more to say. It's, no, diffi- I mean, it's difficult. I mean, it's like an incredibly rich answer. Um, you know, uh, one of the things you made me think about is this, this fact that I think the Red Deal is in most ways like a deeply sort of secular and, and political book, but the sort of theorizing it does feels at certain points spiritual, but that, you know, that is is my bias, right? Like, uh, I think about like Nick Estes talking to Rebecca Nagel about the stereotypical way that settler society reacts to and interprets indigenous spirituality. You know, Estes calls it a perception of like esoteric cultural knowledge that really hinges on a romantic idea um, of of the indigenous like other uh, rather than a real appreciation of the innovation that exists within indigenous communities, you know, or the fact that there is a serious agenda for decolonization um, happening. Um, but, you know, to go back to the interview that I mentioned, you know, Col- Coltard also says in that interview, or he asks, like, how do you fight on the one hand, the symbolic violence of appropriation, and on the other, the kind of psychological desire to indigenize oneself, and therefore legitimize oneself on this land? Like, that's especially difficult when even the modest gestures toward decolonization, like land acknowledgments, are, are sometimes seen as a threat to like the doctrine of discovery itself. Here in Canada, as you mentioned, um, there's a ramping up of this violence. In New Brunswick, for example, um, there was a certain controversy around a leaked memo. Uh, The government of New Brunswick in this memo says that it's currently involved in a number of legal actions which have been initiated by certain certain First Nations against the province, including a claim to ownership and title to over 60% of the province. As a result, the memo says this legal counsel has advised that employees of New Brunswick may not make or issue territorial or title acknowledgements. And they say, while there may be some few situations where it's desirable to issue an ancestral acknowledgement, employees must use the acknowledgement that's been approved by the government, which excludes the terms unceded, unsurrendered, and and so defangs the land land acknowledgement. And I guess I wanted to ask, you know, in this context of of the increasing normalization of land acknowledgements, at least in specific institutional spaces, do you feel like 
they're at all significant or are they're being like made increasingly gestural? Like, are there moments where you feel like there's a productive discomfort or is it like always purely performative? And like, maybe also like do memos like this underscore the fact that there are moments where a land acknowledgement is a serious threat to Western forms of sovereignty. Yeah. I mean, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, a concrete example. So five, so the red nation is seven years old. So we formed in November of 2014 and one of the first two of the first campaigns that we organized um, in our first two years of existence as an organization were to change the seal. Um, so the university seal, so the emblem, right, of the University of New Mexico. So we were founded in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, to change the university seal, but then also to get Indigenous Peoples Day established at the city level to replace Columbus Day, uh, which we got in 2015. And then we successfully replaced the seal uh, I believe it's in 2017. So we won both of those campaigns in a relatively short period of time. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I think it relates to the larger historical and political context, I think that has been unfolding in the United States, at least specifically in relationship to indigenous, um, the rise of indigenous uprisings, the uptick in indigenous mm-hmm. uprisings and movement in mobilization, not really movement building, but mobilization around resource extraction, but also around symbolic violence and racism um, in popular Mm -hmm. culture. But then also the Black Lives Matter movement um, that of course began around the same time, actually, that the Red Nation was founded. And I think we saw last year in the United States, so in 2020, particularly in the summer after George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis in late May, that there was a a boots on the ground uprising, um, the largest protest uh, in US history, that since then, so it's been about a year and a half since that really died down. It didn't die down until kind of the middle of the fall of 2020. Um, And I think with Joe Biden's election as the new president, the, what that, what, what came out of that movement that I see somewhat as a culmination of what had been happening in the, what is that, six, maybe six years prior to that, an indigenous um, and black struggle in the United States was a cultural revolution. And so the the cultural revolution, meaning the the representation of, let's say, racialized populations and popular culture, or the representation um, of people or women of color in positions of political power. So congressional seats, right? Deb Holland um, being uh, chosen for, to, to sit at the head of the Department of the Interior, um, the historic election of, you know, black and Muslim women to Congress in the United States, uh, the remarkable increase of native representation in popular culture, the retiring of the Washington football team mascot, right, which um, I think only happened because of this larger tide, um, this tide, this, I call it a cultural revolution in the United States. Yeah, I mean, there was a patriotic grip on that team name, right? This nostalgic yes, attachment. Well, it, a nostalgic settler attachment. There's no, I mean, there's no yeah. coincidence that it was the football team of the capital of the United States, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. of the settler yeah. capital yeah, yeah. of, of settlerdom <laughs> known as the United States. And so all of these things are happening. Um, and I think that that was a consequence of a lot of the work that we had been doing for five to six years prior to get indigenous people's change, people's day changed, right. To get something like a seal of a university, which is just symbolic, right? It's about the politics of representation, how native people were being represented and portrayed in that seal. And then we were always attaching concrete demands for, you know, decolonization and, you know, um, getting like corporate polluters off of native land and land back and all of these things. But that that symbolic change really was significant. And it has been significant, I think, historically and politically in the United States over this past handful of years. And even though I would say liberal establishment politics um, and just the way liberalism, again, uh, really guts, I think, the radical kind of militant demands of movements. And in that in that gutting, it, what really happens is it translates and it transfers the actual material change that's being demanded by grassroots movements into the regimes of recognition um, and the regimes of representation that are really just about kind of tokenization, right? It's about crumbs. 
It's about um, creating like this notion that we can peacefully reconcile and that indigenous people will just like give up right on our demands. Once we get a few women in power, you know, and you like retire a football team. So that liberal conversion, right, from kind of the on the ground material political demands to this largely symbolic regime of representation um, in, in the public realm, like that has happened a lot. And that's really unfortunate, but it's also entirely predictable. That's always how that works, um, especially when you're dealing with liberal nation states. This being said, I think it's incredibly important for people to realize that things like land acknowledgments, which I would include in that long list, that laundry list <laughs> of things that are mm -hmm. now culturally uh, acceptable, almost like politically correct mm -hmm. um, um, in the United States, in places like universities or places like the halls of Congress, right, or places like football teams or places like TV shows and movies, you know, the things that, that constitute the public realm um, in, in any nation and in any nation state that... Yes, that is happening. And it really, it's that conversion, right, into that re those, re those liberal regimes of um, recognition and representation aren't about responding to, respecting, or, you know, making any real changes that are being demanded by grassroots indigenous struggle. But what needs to be remembered is that those changes only happened because of the struggle and that they didn't happen because Joe Biden, you know, had the goodness in his heart all of a sudden to make May 5th Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Day, for Awareness Day, for example. And that really, when we try to think about how, what is the engine of history? You know, the engine of history isn't this sort of liberal fiction of inclusion. You know, the greater inclusion we have, the more political change we'll, we will, you know, advance and we will be able to achieve. But that actually the engine of history is the mobilization and the movement of people themselves. And that power... Um, whether it's power that's vested in states or power that's vested in the ruling class, will always and must always respond to the power of the people, quite frankly. We saw the power of the people last year in the United States. We'll have to respond to the power of the people because that power is power. It's actually powerful, and it's really giving them a run for their money. And it does actually represent a remarkable threat, not just to the symbolic order of things, but to like the very fabric, right, of like liberal settler ontology, right? It is, I think, deeply unsettling. And the, the rise of, you know, the far right extremism and like contemporary iterations of fascism, settler fascism, particularly in the United States that I think was epitomized by the January 6th storming of Capitol Hill this year, that that response and the remarkable organ self-organization of this kind of like this very extremist, this settler extremism is a direct response to the existential threat that even just a change in the symbolic order represents because it really strikes at the heart of that ontology, that very identity. And so, you know, tokenizing some Indians and doing everything or killing, which is killing people outright in the streets, um, arming yourself and defending the state and defending the status quo of things um, through a lot of different mechanisms, both overtly violent, but and then also kind of through the liberal politics of, of, of inclusion and recognition and representation. But there's an entire toolkit, right, um, that state power uses uh, to maintain the status quo in the face of a really profound and I think a very real material threat um, to its power. Uh, and, of course, to its symbolic power um, in, in the realm of representation. So I think, it's, I think it's all of those things. I think it is both a very real threat, and I think at the same time it's also incredibly complicated the way that within a year all of this stuff has dispersed and gutted the movement while at the same time galvanized the movement. It, there's a lot of moving parts, I think, when you think about representation and recognition. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like, uh, I think your your work is very good at sort of puncturing this sort of um, the the fact of liberalism as sort of a technology of control, basically. Um, you know, you've you've written extensively on the sort of politics of reconciliation, of healing, like the recent writing you've been doing contributes to this growing, growing critical account of how self-care and like these individualistic forms of healing are actually these you know, techniques of control designed to keep people atomized. Like you write in your piece, traumatic monologues, uh, 
uh, published in September in The Baffler, that too often social justice project projects are kind of mired in a ne- neoliberal model of individual healing. Uh, in, in your co-authored piece on the politics of water for the journal Decolonization, you talk about how, quote, healing and conscientization are con- conceptions of decolonization that have claimed somewhat of an exceptional and hegemonic space within in- indigenous intellectual and political labor, often at the expense of other considerations. I didn't know that word. I don't think I'm pronouncing it right. Conscientization um, from Paulo Freire, you know, this idea of like developing, strengthening and changing one's consciousness and like, it's interesting in this context to note that Freire is one of the chief theorists that have been banned in school districts where the teaching of settler colonial violence and white supremacy is seen to threaten patriotic narratives about America as like a bastion of liberty or whatever. Paulo Freire meant, it, meant for it to represent a certain kind of liberation, freeing your mind, a concept that is seemingly very divisive within projects of decolonization. And I, I guess I wondered if you could expand specifically on this idea that you can't be stuck in a process of healing and also be an active agent of history. Like the Red Deal also stresses that it just isn't enough to free our minds, d- despite it being a component of struggle. Um, you know, I guess, it, what does it mean to think critically about how suffering is turned into something called trauma? And what are some different approaches to decolonization that challenge the notion that individual transformation is the primary and predictive building block of decolonization, as you put it? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I think it's a point well taken that Freire is on probably a growing list. It would, Freire's work would, work would probably, like in the Tucson School District or other places where there's an incredible right-wing backlash against critical race theory, um, Freire's work would probably be considered CRT within that um, far-right discourse um, that's currently unfolding in the United States, but in fact is banned, right? Because this idea of freeing your mind through education, or at least in the realm of education, is incredibly threatening, right? To, like you said, the patriotic mm-hmm. narrative or to the status quo more generally. And yeah. the thing is, so let me backtrack a little bit here. Like, I'm an educator, <laughs> right? I'm a professor, Um, I work in a university. I work constantly with students of many ages from all over the place. I produce knowledge that I presumably, I hope, would be consumed in classrooms or in other educational spaces. Those don't necessarily have to be defined or confined to a formal classroom setting. And what we're seeing, I think, is part of this cultural revolution and then um, this reactionary backlash against the cultural revolution, because it is very threatening in the United States, is a full scale assault on education. Um, it's so telling that that's like the site of struggle, right? I, it's actually, it's telling. I, it's interesting that it went from kind of boots on the street, literal fist fights um, yeah. and like guns in your face. I participated in the uprising. Um, the, the, the uprising that happened in New Mexico in response to the larger Black Lives Movement uprising last year, um, this very kind of physical assault that was happening in that way. And we're a little over a year after, um, in the aftermath of that, and it is like firmly turned towards the halls of education um, mm-hmm. and especially universities, right, which are being framed as like these liberal enclaves, um, these communist enclaves <laughs> you know, and all these things. Mm-hmm. And so... The fact that education is a front line, um, I'm actually not sure the movement understands right now that education is an important front line. Um, I think that there needs to be more organizing and mobilization at universities. I mean, historically, student movements have been one of the most important and effective kind of pillars of larger kind of revolutionary changes that have happened because of movements anywhere. Um, but certainly in the United States historically. Um, And so I haven't seen student movements as strong these days, even though education is a new front line. But I think what I'm trying to say is that it makes makes a lot of sense um, that the realm of ideas um, and the realm of kind of intellectual production is this very tense uh, contact zone right now Um, politically, it's a battleground, actually. I would say every class you teach, um, every lecture you give, every hire, every student that you talk to is a battleground. Hmm. And the thing is, 
you know, Freire, Freire was, he was a teacher. He was, he was a, you know, he was a pedagogue. He was talking about pedagogy in a particular setting. And so I think for him, what he thought was the, the arena, right? What education and kind of what knowledge is about is this kind of like individual transformation. So knowledge will set you free, right? This, this, mm-hmm. this um, notion or this kind of saying that we have. And I think as an educator, I don't necessarily see knowledge um, or even education at, through an individualist lens. Uh, I think that conscientization, uh, which is something that he, he coined was, and which has been taken up in um, a pretty strong thread of the literature on decolonization in indigenous studies and indigenous political spaces, is this idea that our personal or individual relationship with ideas will somehow translate into material action that will then lead towards kind of like a larger structural change. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Marxist, actually. And this Marx, Marx has really helped me and the Marxist traditions that I build on politically and intellectually have really helped me understand how, you know, this kind of like the, the notion that we have ideas first and then change comes later is actually like a profoundly liberal assumption of how you understand, A, how history happens, how things unfold, how things change, um, but also how we have a relationship with ourself, like the concept of the self. And that in fact, ideas in and of themselves are not terribly impactful (laughs) or important if they're not in dialectical relationship with action. And that individual change or individual growth let's say through education. I mean, of course, I've had remarkable individual growth through uh, my trajectory as a learner and now as a producer of knowledge and, and, and a teacher, you know, an educator. But that that is less important to me than the relationships that I have in a larger collective, right? The relationships I have that are outside of myself and how those ideas become translated into collective action, let's say in a space like a, a campaign that the Red Nation has organized and that, in fact, I have become a much stronger thinker and that my relationship with ideas has fundamentally shifted since I became an organizer um, and since we founded the Red Nation. And that is because of this larger understanding, right, that there must be a dialectical relationship between action and between knowledge or between action and ideas. And that, I mean, Freire famously called it praxis also mm. um, in the same book where he outlined what conscientization was and that my my intellectual the things that i produce intellectually um now are directly and thoroughly responsive to and also derived from the struggle itself and that that struggle is not a struggle that i go through as an individual but it's a struggle that i go through inevitably in relationship to two other people three other people 30 other people in the red nation 200 people on a front line or 50,000 people at a protest and this is why i talk a lot about relationality too in my work. And I think that there also there just needs to be a different conception of what is the purpose of education if it's not for, you know, kind of like folding, folding ourselves back into bolstering the idea of liberal individualism, if it's not about kind of this liberal enlightenment emphasis on the abstraction of ideas, abstraction from materiality is what I mean. This is what Marx mm-hmm. famously critiqued um, when it came to, to Hegel. And so how do we think about education? How do I engage with my students? Um, or how do I engage in pedagogy? I feel like protests are pedagogy. I feel like everything is pedagogical, frankly. And so I don't really think, I don't distinguish yeah. those things um, between formal settings and quote unquote informal settings. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do we conceive of this through a very collectivist, a much larger scale and like a relational um, framework rather than one that is about a bounded individual kind of utilizing the things that they learn to become a better person, you know, or Mm -hmm. to advance their career or even to advance a political agenda. Um, And of course, for me, even writing is a relational process and a very collective process. And, you know, I see that. And I really, you know, I feel like you model that in a lot of ways, um, that the Red Nation models that. Um, And, you know, like in the acknowledgement section of your doctoral thesis, for example, you write this really beautiful tribute to the Red Nation. Um, You write specifically that you 
quote, had the profound honor of getting to know remarkable and inspiring freedom fighters through political activism with the Red Nation, their friendship, wisdom, strength, and dedication to Native people, you say changed your life, and in the process changed your approach to writing, as you're sort of saying, um, and, and that it was like this transformative thing. And I guess I wondered if you could maybe explain how that took place and how or why other folks in academia and elsewhere might use the potential of a care network to find that same sort of transformation. Like how specifically do you think you're a different scholar because of the Red Nation? Um, what did collaboration with those folks teach you? And I guess, how did it inform this method that you have uh, that you call interreflexivity, uh, which you talk about in your Politics of Water essay with um, uh, Kucha Risling Baldi? You know, this notion of interreflexivity, is that something that you only learn through this kind of collaborative practice? I so there's this interesting thing. I'm going to I'm actually going to write a history of the Red Nation. It's one of my four book projects <laughs> on nice. my plate. Um it probably won't happen for a few years, but one of the reasons why I'm just going to do it is because every like literally every academic or even journalistic rendering of the Red Nation, whether it's a specific campaign or people trying to theorize about the larger kind of contributions we have made to maybe social or political understandings of any number of things, decolonization or, you know, feminism um, or the role of women, you know, anything that would be of kind of interest to kind of th theoretically interesting, um, especially for, for academic, uh, academically trained intellectuals. Um, everyone gets it wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying this from kind of a seat of arrogance as a co-founder and somebody who's been, you know, um, deeply on the inside and just kind of on the, the day in and the day out of the organization, mm -hmm. but that... The, but there's a real misunderstanding. There's a real misunderstanding, mm -hmm. even though I feel like we are very clear about who we are. Um, and so the fact that there is such a misunderstanding, even though we're clear about who we are, tells me that there's some sort of, you know, there's there's some sort of like political, like a kind of a blind spot that's happening in this process of translation. I think it has a lot to do with liberalism again. So I'm going to try to unpack that. But what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say is that I think... Um, you know, the the reason why academics in particular, journalists typically write sensationalist things. They they try to find a story or an angle and then they try to fit you into that angle that is inevitably not, it does not do justice actually to the reality of something that has happened. So there's a lot of like fabrication in a way, or there's a lot of minimizing of the full complexity of something that happens in journalism. So that's just what happens in journalism. It's That's just the way it goes. But for the academic renderings um, of the Red Nation, the history of the Red Nation, um, I think that some of that happens because there is a really profound lack of engagement by academics in movements themselves. And there's a really strong misunderstanding of what it means to be radical <laughs> that is much more participating in this realm of kind of ideas um, and that if we if we have the perfect idea or the perfect theory of change or the perfect theory of revolution, um, or if we write a book that advances, you know, a very sophisticated theory or a critique um, that will help us to, you know, get closer to revolution, those ideas don't mean much unless they come from and are attached to movements. And mm -hmm. I said this earlier, but I feel like it, it it's worth repeating that there is this kind of built in because of this dedication to the world of ideas first and foremost, and not ideas and dialectical relationship <laughs> with action and with collective movement, not just the self, not just the individual producing knowledge, that there tends to be this like dedication to an obsession in academic writing about indigenous politics or other types of kind of radical spectrum kind of politics that there is this kind of obsession with ambiguity um, where it's like, well, like we can't really say whether or not this movement is good or bad. Um, and that this dedication to ambiguity means that, you know, academics don't necessarily have to take a stand politically when mm -hmm. it, they, all they have to do is analyze and critique. And somehow that critique turns into radical politics. And that's just not how that, that's not how that works. You know, mm -hmm. movements are incredibly complicated. They're messy. They're filled with people. History itself is incredibly complex. And 
the desire to have pure ideas and pure politics is, I think, really the height of liberal individualism, first of all, but it's just incredibly pessimistic and cynical. And I'm not a person who is very good at trafficking and ambiguity. I think that, you know, indigenous frontline struggles that are always in face of grave danger, you know, indigenous people are overrepresented in the assassination of environmental activists across the world. You know, we're literally saving the planet. Like the Indigenous Environmental Network just released a report in August that um, quantified the amount of carbon emissions that have been prevented from being released into the atmosphere by indigenous frontline struggles in North America alone. It's almost 25%. And, you know, those people on those front lines aren't trafficking in ambiguity. They're not trafficking, trafficking in like the petty bourgeois <laughs> kind of conceit of knowledge production. They're really in a life or death situation. They have clear enemies. They have clear goals. Um, and they have a clear mandate, you know, that's really set forth by our ancestors and by our indigenous original instructions. And so for me, trafficking and certainty, the certainty I have as an indigenous revolutionary, um, the certainty that I have in the vision and the work and the sacrifice of indigenous revolutionaries of the past, right, my ancestors and my predecessors, that is what guides me very differently in the way that I write. And I get into a lot of arguments. You know, I really upset a lot of academics mm. who want to just, they just want to ask open-ended questions all the time about mm -hmm. politics. And I'm like, whole paragraphs of them sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually, even like famous white feminists, famous white leftists, um, you know, they really, they, I, I upset them, not because I'm trying to, it's not because I'm flexing, just by being me and trafficking in certainty, indigenous right. feminist certainty. I don't, it makes them very uncomfortable, right? Because of this like weird commitment to ambiguity that means mm -hmm. you don't actually have to land somewhere hard you know, and mm -hmm. really like do the difficult work on the ground of like working with people in relationship to build a collective struggle for liberation. And so I think that's just what that's taught me. I just have a really firm grounding and I refuse to walk away from that. And so I think that makes my work, you know, possibly less theoretically interesting to people who are interested in theoretically interesting things. Um, I think that theory from the struggle, theory from the ground up is rich and complex, but also directly responsive to the really urgent needs that we're facing. I don't really know how you can traffic in ambiguity when the world is dying, everything is on fire, millions of people have perished from COVID-19, and we're facing like a 30-year climate disaster clock. That's not, we're not in a moment of uncertainty and ambiguity. We're in a moment where like certainty and action is like what you should be doing. <laughs> I, I just like, and there's an urgency and a utopian spirit to so much of your writing that is mm -hmm. clearly coming from that, as you say, kind of uh, trafficking and certainty rather than, you know, the, the luxury of ambiguity. You're actually inviting us to imagine in your work, the dream of having just extra trillions of dollars to empower <laughs> us to achieve a just energy transition. Like you're arguing for an abolitionist politics and like, those are radical goals that can be risky to to articulate in writing, but it does provide a real clarity. I would I would certainly say, um, you know, the Red Deal marks this tw 2019 surge in climate activism, noting that this was a moment where quote Indigenous people came down from the mountains and forests, blockading capital cities, um, and you know, the, this idea that there's a kind of uh, uh, migration from rural to urban that's politically and even maybe spiritually important at a moment of climate catastrophe where we can't have any ambivalence, any uncertainty. Um, you know, it takes on a different meaning when you have democracy now, you know, covering the more than 1,000 environmental defenders that have been killed since the Paris, Paris Agreement. One in three of those victims are indigenous, right? But at the same time, as you point out in the Red Deal, indigenous, quote, demands are marginalized within mainstream environmentalism. Um, and as, as a result, you know, in mainstream environmentalism, which is liberal, misses the point about capitalism and indigenous sovereignty. And I guess the, the last question I want to ask is like, to what extent do you think this is just a function of media control? Because I noticed that Jen Wickham on last week's Red Nation podcast pointed out that those who are actually standing in the way of extractive industries 
are reporting on the reality of that struggle from the grassroots, from the kitchen tables, as Wickham puts it. You know, while Coastal Gaslink has the Canadian media basically in its pocket in many ways. Against this, things like the Red Nation podcast are working to build power, I think, by amplifying the stories of people like Slato. So the podcast is is amplifying these particular voices. Do you feel like these insurgent voices are beginning to penetrate mainstream media? Or is it like, does it really, is it the same struggle to tear down the walls that prevent people from actually taking part in politics? I think that's an excellent question. And of course, we started the podcast right two years ago um, as a type of media to just pr- give ourselves a platform that was not being given to us, right? Mm. You can't kind of claw at the halls of power, whether it's corporate media or even um, kind of alternative media to give Indigenous people a platform. And the philosophy we've always had in the Red Nation is like, we don't need permission to do the right thing. This is our land. <laughs> We're just going to move forward as if this is our land because it is and with the power of what that means. And so we just started to create our own indigenous media platform. The podcast is the first thing, it won't be the last. Mm -hmm. And we've actually been actively building um, kind of radical left indigenous media for the last two years. Um, It's called Red Media. It's not the same as the Red Nation, it's its own independent organization, um, but it has a relationship with the Red Nation. So folks should check us out. So the Red Nation podcast is part of this larger Red Media project that we're working on. And for us, it's really, we, we understand two main things in red media. First, that capitalism, right? Capitalism has completely over-determined um, the role and the function of media. And because we have an anti-capitalist politics and a commitment uh, in red media and in the red nation, we understand that you know media that comes from below and, and from the left is incredibly important for providing a space, right? For, for doing this work, for doing political education, for reporting on these types of struggles and it being indigenous only and unapologetically indigenous was something that was also very important to us. Um, so that's actually the second one. There's actually a third one. There's three of them. The third pillar, right? So it's it's anti-capitalist. Um, it's indigenous only, unapologetically indigenous only. Um, and the third is that we understand from kind of the history of left struggles, right? That what we're in right now, this cultural revolution I've been talking about in this interview is that there's a war of ideas. This is why universities are being attacked by the right wing, that we are also in a war of ideas and we must be serious about engaging in a war of ideas as much we are as we are in, in engaging in kind of a, a tactical war in other ways. And that media is just absolutely one of the most important tactics you know, that we have in our, our arsenal and in our toolbox to advance our movements because I mean, the right, the right is, is really organized. <laughs> You know, like the liberal establishment, they're just always going to be there. But, you know, like the real enemies, I think, of historic change are organizing. They're organizing fast. They're more well-funded than we are. And so we need to take ourselves seriously in terms of building power. And a lot of that power is in media. And what we do in the media has everything to do with politics, right? Has everything to do with the political change we're seeking. One last thing I did want to say pertaining to your earlier comment is that I think, you know, a huge part of the reason why the environmental justice movement, the mainstream, primarily liberal movement, and and I think academics um, get it wrong when it comes to the Red Nation, when it comes to indigenous struggles for decolonization, is that they can't imagine the end of the United States. Hmm. You know, for them, it's like we need to appeal to the best of democracy or to the best of liberal principles. And like that will get us out of the predicament that we're in. And the thing about indigenous struggles and the thing about the Red Nation and just my own political stance is that like indigenous people knew what life was like before the advent of the United States. And we deeply pray for and hope for the end of the United States, because that would mean the end of our colonization and it would mean land back for us. And so we already know what the world could and should look like, you know, with the end of that colonial relation that the United States represents to us. And so I just really encourage people to think about a world where the United States didn't just like exert this remarkable imperial and colonial violence on everybody yeah. <laughs> in the globe. Like if that's your starting point for politics, you're already in really good shape. For sure. And thank you so much. I'll let you go. Uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you could carve out the time. Thank you so much for inviting me.